Praise the Lord. So excited to be back home. Um, it was a, a little, little cold up there. Someone asked me. It was a little chilly, but overall it was a, a pretty uh, good weekend. And uh, spiritually, man, it was a, a fired up weekend. Amen. Uh, again, thank you to all of our veterans and those of you that stood just a few minutes ago. We are really so grateful for you and your service to our country. Um, I did want to follow up on just uh, Thanksgiving with the pastors. Listen, it's going to be a great time, and I heard that there's going to be an apple crisp, Pastor Mary said competition, but I think it's a war. <laughs> it's an apple crisp war that's going to take place on Wednesday, and as a matter of fact, I think I even might have seen some apples flying from the kitchen a few times as they're preparing for, for Wednesday. So you don't want to miss it, and uh, it's going to be a, a great time of fellowship, food, and fun. Um, this morning, um, I'm very excited. So uh, as we enter chapter 5, and I was looking through the breakup and looking at Pastor Connor, wanting him to preach, and then wanting Pastor Bill will be preaching next week, um, I kind of did it differently. We've been going sequentially through uh, the Word of God and through the Scripture, but I broke chapter 5 up just a little bit. I opened... Uh, I'm sorry, no, yeah, I opened, Pastor Connor kind of went to the end, I'm backing up just a little bit, and then Pastor Bill will begin a new chapter next week. And uh, I did that intentionally uh, because I was super excited about this part of chapter five that we're about to read. And uh, so I just have been praying and asking God to really open our hearts and open our eyes to what he's wanting to work in us today. And a new faith, may a new faith, a stronger faith, a mighty faith arise within this church for all that God is wanting to do and desiring to do through those who will believe in the power of God at work in them. Amen? If we go to the book of Acts chapter 5, we're going to begin at verse 12 and read through verse 16 as our primary text this morning. We read this, now many signs and wonders were regularly done, let me start over, now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's portico, none of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem, and more than ever believers were added to the Lord. Let me read that over again, and more than ever believers were added to the Lord multitudes of both men and women so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats as that as Peter came by at least his shadow might fall on some of them verse 16 the people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits and they were all say all and they were all healed now this morning, we're going to primarily focus in on signs and wonders. There's actually, we could have spent two or three weeks just on this portion of scripture, and it would have been a lot of fun. So I'm gonna encourage you to write down uh, this, these scriptures and go back and maybe do a little digging yourself, verses five, or chapter five, verses 12 through 16. But this morning, I wanna focus in on the signs and wonders piece. As apostles, we're preaching and teaching Jesus Christ as the risen Messiah, Savior and Lord. Signs and wonders were beginning to happen and more and more frequently. Signs and wonders and miracles were a very real way that God used his followers, his disciples, his apostles to validate his message that he commanded them to preach to the world around them. If we back up to Acts chapter 4, we're going to reread, I say reread because we've already gone through chapter four. We're gonna reread verses 29 through 31, which says, and now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Now, those believers, <laughs> they petitioned God to give them the ability to preach the gospel with power. Amen. So I'll pause there for just a moment, not in my notes. But when is the last time, don't raise your hand, of course, I just am asking you a contemplative question. When is the last time you personally, in your prayer time, asked God for boldness to preach the gospel 
When's the last time you said, Lord, as I head out the door today, I pray that you would fill me with the power of your spirit to represent you in the world that I'm going out into. When's the last time in your devotional time in the morning before you set foot out that door that you prepared your heart, your mind, and let God prepare your soul with the understanding that you're a vessel of God, ready, ready for him to be able to use when he moves upon us through the power of his Holy Spirit. Our hearts got to be ready, folks. They prayed and they asked for the power, the boldness. So must we. And they were not simply asked. I'm going to. There's a, a ringing going on in the in the house behind me. I don't know if you can hear it, but it's kind of distracting me just a little bit, Cristiano. Um, they weren't really asking the Lord to help them preach a better sermon. Listen. They weren't asking God to help them to be better with the words that they speak or how they bring it or to do more good in the world. What they wanted was the power of God to invade the lives of those that they were connecting with, with the power of God to display the power of the gospel of the message that they were bringing to them. And along with that, we begin to see that with that power, as God shared through these disciples and through these apostles and through the early church, that there were dramatic things that began to follow their message. And that was healings and deliverances and provision and a whole lot more. And we're going to find out why for just a moment. But the reality was, is they desired for the supernatural to be at work within them. The supernatural God, Jehovah God, the one who gave them his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died on the cross, shed his blood, and then filled them with the power of his Holy Spirit to accomplish his plans and purposes upon the earth. These early believers desired for the supernatural to be at work so that the power of God could be seen and displayed as they preached the good news. See, the the, the supernatural works of these miracles and, and the deliverances of people from demonic forces and spirits and the, the provision that God was giving to them was all to display the power of God to validate the message that they preached. Are you with me this morning? These were not just words, empty words that they were telling people about. These were not some just Greek mythology stories that, that they were telling people about and hoping that they would believe and turn their heart to this God. No, they were changed themselves by the power of God. They were transformed themselves by the power of God. They were touched by the power of God. And now they wanted the world, the world to feel the power of the God that changed them so that they too could be impacted by his mighty power. Amen. If we go over to the book of James chapter 5, I just wanted to get out of Acts for just a moment so that you see there's a theme here uh, as it comes to the supernatural at work in our lives, even beyond the book of Acts. If we go over to the book of James chapter 5, verse 14 through 16, we're instructed in this way. Is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let him pray over him, anointing him with oil. Oil represents the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Now, I want us to talk for just a few moments this morning about signs and wonders and what their purpose is. And I want, I'm hoping that God will convey that this isn't just a part of a story that we read that happened 2,000 years ago, but this is a part of a story that we read that's a continuing uh, action of God in our lives today. Someone say amen. Number one, signs and wonders, they have a great purpose beyond the outcome. Signs and wonders reveal God's glory. In the Gospel of John, we witness the turning of water into wine at the wedding in Cana. Let's go to John and let's read about this for just a moment. Verses 1 through 11 of chapter 2. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. 
his mother said to the servants, do what he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. And Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and when the people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. The disciples knew that there was only water in the jar. See, we, we look at the water that was turned to wine and we think that that's the miracle, but God was really trying to do something here on a deeper level. He was trying to display to his disciples the glory and the power of God that was in him. Someone say, I understand. No one else knew what had happened. This person, uh, the, the, the honored guest, did not know where this wine had come from or that it was water turned to wine. But the disciples knew because they filled those jars with water, but yet now they were turned to wine. And not only just wine, but perceived to be the best of wine, save for last. Tell me that did not challenge the disciples to say, whoa. This person that we're following, this person that we're learning from, he holds a power that we're not acquainted with. It turned their attention to the glory of God inside of Jesus Christ himself. The miracle revealed the power of God that was upon Jesus. And it literally set the stage for Jesus' ministry upon the earth. This is in the word of God. It's undeniable. Jesus did not do the miracle simply because they ran out of wine. His purpose was firmly established so that they would know who he was and they would understand the power that was upon him. These supernatural events were just the beginning. These signs and wonders and, and miracles would become the signature mark of the Lord Jesus Christ and his ministry upon those three and a half years that he moved in a miraculous way upon the earth. In Acts chapter two, going back just a little bit further, we'll reread this scripture, verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst as you yourselves know. That is, they knew, they'd seen, they, they'd seen Jesus at work. Not only did Jesus heal the sick, not only did he open the blinded eyes, and cast out demons and cause the lame to walk and raise the dead. But Jesus himself would be crucified, was crucified upon the cross. And he was buried in a grave. And on the third day, Jesus himself was raised from the dead to new life. Someone say, praise God. And from that moment, that very moment of his resurrection, there were hundreds of people that, ceased, that saw the risen Christ. Glory to God as Jesus revealed himself to them before he ascended into heaven. All of these things, supernatural. All of these things, miraculous. All of these things, revealing the glory and the power of the God that was upon Jesus Christ, who was fully God himself and also fully man. Number two, signs and wonders, they confirm the gospel message. Throughout the book of Acts, we see that the apostles, they were used in performing miracles. This was a divine endorsement upon God's commissioning upon them and the truth that they proclaimed. Even more so than God commissioning them was the message that they bore. Are you with me this morning? It was the message, the truth. These supernatural happenings were intended to increase the faith of those who were hearing this gospel message. They were, were, were hoping, uh, not hoping, but God was moving in this miraculous way so that the faith in these people could arise to the point that they would believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. I remember back when I was a, a young adult, probably, I don't know, uh, 19, 20, somewhere in there, maybe 21 years of age. And I went from Omaha, Nebraska on a seven-hour drive up to Trinity Bible College in Aberdeen, South Dakota, one of our Assembly of God colleges. 
Laurel Lundstrom, who was a great, well-known um, uh, evangelist back in the 70s and, and 80s. He was uh, the president of the college at that time, and, and they, it was a college day, so there were students from all over the region that were there to see the college, and it was a great time of worship and, and the preaching of the word, and there were hundreds of kids. I was among hundreds of students that were there. And I'll never forget the one night that we were worshiping God. It was just a normal worship service, much like what was happening here this morning. And all of a sudden, as we're worshiping God, we heard something that did not align with the notes that we were singing. It was a wailing and a screaming almost of shock that overtook the voices and even the instruments that filled the room. And all of a sudden, everything just got quiet. Nobody knew what was going on. Was someone hurt? Did someone fall? Did someone break a leg? We had no idea. The room got really quiet and everybody's kind of looking around trying to figure out what was going on. And uh, then after a few minutes or so, um, we began worshiping again, and then worshiping until the close, and then Laurel Lundstrom got up, and he uh, began to address all of us, and he shared with us what took place. There was a young lady uh, about my age uh, who was there for college days. She was born deaf, born deaf. And as she was worshiping and praising God, I don't know, they do that, they're with us. Um, and as she was worshiping and praising God in her own way, one of her ears opened up and she could hear sound for the very first time. Now, let me tell you, they brought the girl up on the stage, and that was my very first time of seeing a miracle actually transpire in the room where I was. And that has not happened to me often, by the way. But I'll never forget that moment. I'll never forget that moment inside me. Though I was born and raised in the church, though I gave my life to the Lord Jesus Christ at the age of six years old, though I had many encounters being baptized in the power of the Holy Spirit at the age of 13, baptized in water, right? after. I'll never forget that moment when that girl got up there and they're telling us what was happening uh, with her ear. I can tell you the faith of validation that just came over my mind and my body, the chills that I felt as I'm just like saying to myself, even though I believed there was something inside my inner voice going, he's real, he's real, and he really does have the power to heal, praise God. I remember that moment. It was incredible. It caused my faith, my personal faith, as a young 19, 20-year-old man to soar. In the book of Acts chapter 2, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost was accompanied by miraculous signs. All of it was drawing attention to the message of salvation, the gospel message through Jesus Christ. These signs were not isolated events, but they were integral components, all to bring validation to the gospel message that was being preached. And from that point on, miracles, signs, wonder, and the supernatural of the healing of the sick and the raising of the dead were often seen as a demonstration of the power of God, God's divine authority at work in and through the men of God, the women of God. In the gospels, Jesus performed himself numerous miracles to show that he had God's power and God's authority upon his life. Miracles capture people's attention and they serve as a powerful witness to the truth of the gospel. And when people witness these extraordinary events that defy ordinary explanations, there's no explanation for the girl who was born deaf and she's in a worship service worshiping God in her own way and all of a sudden her ear opens up. There's no doctor that can explain that. A miracle defies ordinary explanation. That's why it's called or deemed a miracle. Miracle signs and wonders can be a means to breaking through skepticism. It's why as a young man who did fully believe, my faith soared in that moment in that experience. So for the skeptic who's hearing the message of God when a miracle takes place or happens, can you not help but see how that skepticism can begin to be worn down? Are you with me? Are you with me? Powerful. When miraculous events occur in conjunction with the gospel being preached or proclaimed, it's often interpreted as a confirmation of God's activity within and through that person. In actuality, it has nothing to do with the person. 
other than they were willing, other than they were obedient to the leading of the Holy Spirit. It was the power of God working through that person that brought that incredible, miraculous moment. If miracles and signs and wonders ever take place and the gospel is not preached, listen to me. If you're ever at a place where miracles begin to take place. Oh, maybe they're worshiping. Maybe they're having a good worship service. And then maybe they uh, move into a time and you start seeing miracles. But the gospel message is never preached. And the invitation to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior is never given. I just want to say right now, watch out. Be careful. Be on high alert and high discernment. Let's go to the book of Matthew chapter 7 and read verses 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare, God speaking, I never knew you, Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Listen, there are those who use the name of Jesus for their own purposes. Are you with me? There are those who use the name of Jesus for their own fame and their own fortune. And they really do not care about people coming to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. We've got to be careful if you're ever in a place where you're witnessing miraculous things and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is not presented and salvations outweigh the number of miracles. I'm just saying be very careful to who you're listening to. Number three, signs and wonders inspire our faith, just like the story I told you. My faith was inspired, and they create a transformative work that goes deeper on the inside of us. Our final thought this morning emphasizes the transforming power, the transformative power of the gospel through signs, through wonders, through miracles, through the supernatural. In the Gospels, we encounter numbers of instances where physical healings symbolize a deeper spiritual reality. See, that's where people sometimes get a little freaky when it comes to miracles and and the supernatural things because often people get attracted to the event itself. Are you listening? Often people get attracted to the event themselves or even the person who's who's God who's God's using to perform the miracles and we got to be really careful because it's not about the miracle the miracle is a tool it's a tool it's only a tool it's not that God doesn't care about our well-being but his real care is about our soul are you with me God does care for our health, but if we are not healed in this life, but we end up in heaven, tell me that's not the greatest of all gain. So miracles are only a tool, but unfortunately, the heart of a man sometimes is attracted to the miracle versus the deeper thing that's taking place in the life of a person, and that's the transformative power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, amen. Jesus not only healed the people physically, but he also forgave them of their sins, highlighting the profound connection between the physical healing and the spiritual restoration that should be taking place at the same time. Mark 2, 2, 12 says this, he got up, he took his mat, and he walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone. And they praised God saying, we have never seen anything like this before. Here we have a man who was lame and could not walk and Jesus healed him in front of them all and it was an incredible moment of validating God's power but that man in the rest of the story we go on to see how he was praising God in the midst of uh, of of all of them and he was not used to being seen as praising God in such a way. And there are so many stories of different types of miracles of Jesus and the apostles and disciples as we move on through the book of Acts. And if you go back to the beginning of Acts chapter 3, to a story where we camped on for quite a long time, we have the story of the lame beggar at what was the name of the gate? That beautiful gate, a very similar story. And when the beggar asked Peter and John for money, Peter and John said this in verse three, uh, chapter three, verse six, I have no silver and gold, but what I have I give you 
in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And then what happened? Let's read the rest of the story. We're going to go back. We're going to reread again. 7 through 10. He took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stu stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and what? And praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. You see, the purpose of miracles, signs, and wonders, and walking in the supernatural, they're not for the miracle signs, and wonders themselves. It's to demonstrate the power of the gospel and the power of a God through, through the work of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and now working in the hearts of a man or a woman who has the faith to believe and God moves in a supernatural way, amen? Its intention is to transform the life of a person from the inside out and to lead them to Jesus Christ. You see, his power is a transformational power, not just exteriorly. We're missing it, and that's where people get their eyes on the exterior. It's really working exteriorly to get to the inside, to change our hearts. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 25 through 27 says, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness, and from all your idols I will cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of, of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey all my rules. I'm gonna ask the worship team to make their way back up. Jesus Christ commissioned his followers to carry out supernatural things, ministry, as they preached the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And his intention was never to amaze people by the supernatural acts themselves. His intention was to display the power of God that their faith might rise to a level to believe. Amen? His intention was never to send out a group of social workers who just had a message, or merely to attend to physical needs while talking about a loving God. But rather, Jesus sent them out with power and with his authority to cast out demons, to deal with diseases, and to proclaim the kingdom of God to the sick, and not just the physically sick, but those who were sick with sin, to deliver them from the power of that sin. Amen. Glory to God. Many of you in this room, and myself included, we've all been touched by the power of the gospel. We're here this morning because God did deal with the sickness of our souls. We say, well, Pastor Tim, I never personally have seen a miracle. Listen, if you're saved, every day you look in the mirror, you're witnessing the greatest miracle of all. Hallelujah. For what good does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What good does it, would it be to come to the altar and be healed exteriorly, but your soul still be sick with sin? Are you with me this morning? The greatest miracle ever performed was the salvation of our soul. And now being able to walk in a relationship with God himself through what Christ has done for us. See, look, there was nothing subtle about the commissioning that Jesus had upon his disciples or those that would follow him. Clearly, we were meant to follow this supernatural God into the world. And as Christ followers, we've got to understand that we are a part of a supernatural movement of God upon the face of this planet. And I believe that we are living in the last days. And that little breaking up of my voice is not in sadness. It's actually in a manner that I can't even believe that I may be getting, you may be getting the honor and the privilege of being alive in a time where Jesus could really come back at any time. Someone say, praise God. And I believe that with all the brokenness that's in the world around us and all the darkness that surrounds us, 
And with all the evil that seems to be increasing, I believe that God's getting ready to raise up a church in the power of his righteousness and the power of his mighty right hand. And I believe that the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit that moved freely among the disciples 2,000 years ago are about ready to be unleashed through his people again. Those who will have faith. Why? So that we can become popular and famous and draw a crowd? Absolutely not. This world needs to see that there's a God who is real, and he's powerful, and he's greater than all of their sin. Amen. And for those of us who will believe and have the faith to pray those kind of prayers and walk in such a manner of faith, I believe that you and I, like the early church, will become a part of a church that God's going to use in these last days to provoke a revival of people who are not only physically being healed or delivered of demonic activity, but they're coming to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. And I believe that this is a missing ingredient in a lot of churches today. And I understand it. I grew up, you know, I want to get off track, but I grew up in the church and I've seen I've seen things and been uncomfortable with things and had lack of understanding of things. And and so I get it. I get why a lot of times in the church we kind of just, we believe it, but we just kind of like step back just a little bit because we lack the faith to understand it. But if we can grasp the fact that God's supernatural mighty power does work through our lives, through the power of his spirit who lives in us, And it's not for the exterior things being done or witnessed in and of themselves. But it's fully so that the grace of God can be understood by the heart of a sinner who needs to possess the same hope that you and I have come to find. Well, Pastor Tim, I believed without a miracle. Wow. That's that's, that's a powerful miracle in and of itself. And what... How much more gratitude should that be for us towards God that it didn't take a miracle for us to have to believe in him, but we believed by simple faith. But there are so many different voices going on in the world around us that I believe we're in such a time, such a day, where the power of God is about to be displayed in an incredible way so that the world might know that he is really, truly the God of the universe, and the Savior for their souls. Would you stand all over this place this morning? This is what we're gonna do. I think preachers, because I, my own insecurity, there are times that I, I've, this is probably the first time I've preached a message of this type. Not, I'm not talking about maybe inferencing different things, but preaching it boldly like this. Because there's an insecurity that can come upon us. You know, like we preach something like this, we have faith, and then what if miracles never happen? What if God's power is never displayed? And you know what? I'm just at a place where I say, I just believe the word of God. And I'm just gonna step out in faith. And it's not my job to make a miracle happen. Are you with me? But if I never do step out in faith, one thing I guarantee you, (laughs) though God can act independently, absolutely. (laughs) He doesn't need Tim Moen or you. Are you with me? But if I don't step out in faith, because I do believe his word and he's chosen to work through people, if I don't step out in faith, then I probably, listen, will never see that miracle. Are you, you hear what I'm saying? So we got to get to a place where we're willing to walk in faith, even if nothing happens. <laughs> God, I don't know why nothing happens. I thought that I was walking in faith and obeying you, but we've got to believe that when we pray over the sick, that they're going to be healed. And then we leave it in God's hands. That's where we gotta come to. That's where we gotta get to. So this is, this is my, my prayer. First of all, I wanna preach the gospel. Jesus Christ died on the cross, shed his blood. Who's Jesus? The son of God, fully God, fully man, sent by God into the world to do something for you and I that we could never do on our own, and that's pay the penalty for our sin. He died, he shed his blood. He was buried. Three days later, he rose from the dead, proving he was who he said he was and giving us victory over sin and victory over death. Hallelujah. And we 
come to faith in God through Jesus Christ by simply acknowledging that he is the Christ and we ask for forgiveness and we confess that Jesus Christ is the savior of our soul. That's how we get saved. We come to that place of saying, I'm tired of living for myself and I'm turning to God through Jesus Christ. If you're here this morning in just a moment, we're gonna invite many people to this altar but one of the people that I'm inviting to come forward is you. If you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, but you know you need your heart changed, then I'm gonna invite you to come forward this morning in faith and believe that as you do and as you confess, just say, Jesus, I confess you as my Lord and Savior. Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I believe as you just begin praying those two simple things, you will experience the power of God come upon you from the inside out and relieve a weight off of your shoulders that you walked in here with, amen? So just a moment, as I involve, invite different people to come up, I want you to come up if you need salvation. You need to be saved from your sin. Many of us have gone through that, but there may be someone here who've not yet done that. Secondly, I'm gonna invite anyone who would just say, look, I don't understand everything, pastor, like you, you know? And I do believe the word of God. I do believe what the Word of God says, but Pastor, like you said, I, I'm kind of like just a little timid in that area myself. So this is this is the rest of the, the this is the rest of the altar call. Salvation, number one. Number two, if you just say, God, I'm willing to be a vessel that you can work through. God, I'm willing. If you will help increase my faith and, and raise that faith, God, I'm willing to pray that prayer of faith for healing over a person. God, I'm willing to pray that prayer for that demon to come out of that person. Over the weekend, there was a particular person who was dealing with a lot of stuff. And I was not in the room, but I'm repeating the story that Pastor Rick shared in the baptismal pool last night. Jeff Ajayan was there. Pastor Rick was there. And as they were praying for this person who was dealing with a lot of stuff and just felt like they believed in God but couldn't break through for free, Pastor Rick said that they saw a demon, not physically, they saw a demon come out of the person in the sense that it came out with a yell, and then the person just kind of slumped over and was relaxed, and they got baptized at the end of the night yesterday. They were free to take a new step forward. We're not talking necessarily, freaky things can happen when demons come out of people, but we don't need to be afraid. We're just talking about deliverance, setting people from the demonic stronghold that's upon their life. And it happened this weekend at the Man Up Retreat. So listen, if you're just willing to say, God, I will, if you give me the faith, if you give me the faith, Lord, raise it up in me, I will be that vessel that will not be afraid to pray those prayers of faith over people and let the power of God be displayed in and through my life. And God help me to preach the gospel message loudly and clearly. When that person is healed, let me be the first to tell them it was by the power of God through Jesus Christ who died for your sins on the cross who just set you free in this manner. That Lord, I wanna be a voice for you in this time and season of the world. I will not be silent. I will not sit back. I will not be religious. But Lord God, I will be active in my faith as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? So if that's you this morning, and, and, and I, I know I'm kind of drawing the line, I'll put it this way. I, some of you may not be able to come up for whatever reason, and that's fine. Just raise your hands and do it right there at the seat. But if you feel that hunger just being stirred up in front of you and you just can't stay in your seat because you're like, God, I want to be one of those, okay? Then I want you to come up and join me at this altar for this last song. So if you need salvation, you're coming forward. If you're just saying, God, I'm open. Fill me with the faith to believe and to live out my life in this way, God, and I will. I want you to come forward, all right? And uh, whether you stay in your seat or come forward, we're making no judgments. But let's worship God together and let's not limit the power of God at work in our lives. Amen? Amen.